So, uh, Grace, <laughs> do you have any thoughts to share on these long-lived flies or, or super centenarians or any of the other things Mike has been talking about? Okay, so what do the centenarians have that most people don't have in their genes? The key finding we were able to get out of that data was that um, on the super centenarians uh, at this point was that they, like the the older flies, have a significantly larger mutation burden compared to the reference genome than than the the normal the the, the normal lifespan populations. Yeah, so we can and again, see. Again, what's the mutation burden? It, it just mean, they, it just means they're mutated a lot. That's all. It, 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 it means there's a lot of differences the in their genome. More evolved. Evolved. Okay. All across the genome. So again, mutants. it's more it's evolved. Yeah. So the thing is, the super centenarians, like the O flies, have a shitload of mutations. They're, they're, they're mutated a lot more than, than normal people, but there are so many mutations that given like 25 or 30 people or something, I mean, even if it was 50 people, there's so many mutations there. It's not, wasn't enough data based on the analytics that, that we did when we were looking at it anyway. We didn't find a way to sift through that huge number of mutations yet to come up with a highly confident story of which mutations are most important. Now, revisiting the super centenarian data in the context of the super O fly data could end up being, being interesting and Say the hypothesis, the hypothesis that whatever the most important things in making the super O's live a long time, that the, the orthologs of those in humans will also be highly differentiated in the super centenarians. I mean, that, that's, that's one sort of hypothesis we could explore by, by, by putting these different data sets together. And then, then maybe we'll have an answer to your, your question, Grace. So right now what we know is there's a lot, there's a lot of differences, but, but it's been hard to pin down which ones are the most important. But I have a question. How are the centigenarians able to have more mutations than the average human? Why, are, why do some humans have more mutations than others? And in this case, favorable mutations, but it, it suggests that there are unfavorable mutations too. So how does it happen that, that there's more mutations, that it's not just a normal sort of generational amount? Well, it is. I mean, that's how, that's how evol evolution works, right? I mean, some people will mutate more than others. And if it's a favorable mutation, then you'll reproduce. Most of those mutations are, 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 are passed along. But yeah, there is there is a bunch of subtlety, the accumulation of mutations or like some, some parts of the genome are more susceptible to, to mutating others. So you, you can get some mutations that predispose you to get more mutations in the next generation and then predispose you to get more mutations in the next generation. And we, we don't sort of have the historical data across generations to really answer that question in humans. Now we could, we could gather, we could gather that sort of data about flies much more easily because we got generations going through very quickly. So I think if actually right. if, if, if we took, if we more frequently took DNA and RNA data from the long lived flies a, a, as they evolve month by month and year by year, we could actually probe into that question in regard to the long lived, long lived flies much more easily than into people because we, I mean, to do that with people across generations takes a really long time.